Uh, I haven't achieved anything. I'm not worth introducing. <laughs> not true. All right. Moving quickly on. Yes. So Nick Jackson is a master of wine. Um, he has become a master of wine in 2019. Um, do you want to say? Go ahead, Nick. Tell us. Uh, well, most I think most of you um, are familiar with me because of um, the book I published at the beginning of this year in uh, January um, called Beyond Flavor, which is a book about um, wine tasting and particularly kind of somewhat high level uh, blind wine tasting and how how you do that um, according less on on flavor, hence the name Beyond Flavor and more on structure. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so uh, I think that's sort of how people are getting to know me a little bit. Okay, yes, and this is the book we are talking about, Beyond Flavor. It's available on Amazon, right, Nick? That's right, on Amazon, yep. Yep, okay, and um, you can use it uh, to study for your wine exams, but also to understand a little bit more about the structure of the wines, as we will do tonight. Um, so, Richard, Bailey, welcome. Welcome, Salas. I'm glad you guys could connect. Um, yes, so Salas Bailey and Nicole Ramos, they are both teachers at the Florida Wine Academy. They teach the diversity level one and two. They are here tonight with the wines blind. They don't know what the wines are. And we have Sarah Phillips as well. Sarah is um, a WCT diploma. She teaches for uh, Florida Wine Academy and she works for LiveX in London and she's Miami based. So she's um, one of our British that has uh, done well in Miami. Okay, so um, today we are going to talk about uh, white wines, okay? And I will go over the traditional way of blind tasting and then Nick will tell um, us how we can taste differently. Um, so um, first of all, of course, we always see the color of the wine, okay? And, and for the color, we usually have lemon green, lemon gold, amber, uh, for white wines. And then we try to smell the fruits and the aromas in a white wine. So pear, citrus, lemon, vanilla, uh, grass, oak. And then of course we taste. And for this tasting, we always talk about acidity, if it is high and low and what kind of acidity. Uh, yes, aromas and uh, the structure in here as well. Okay, so that is the traditional way of blind tasting and then if the acidity is medium plus or if it is high if, or if it is low you get into a conclusion on on you know what is the grape or what is the wine inside your glass um, but there are some problems with this so in here let me put this four different varietals so you see here Chenin Blanc, Riesling, Albarino and Gruner Valdina. are you all familiar with this grape Okay, yes, yes, okay. Everybody has tasted them. All right, so um, if you see the color, so yes, Chenin Blanc can be from pale gold to deep gold. Riesling is usually, you know, pale lemon green, but it can be deep gold if you have an aged Riesling as well. Albarino is more yellow, so pale lemon. Gruner, pale lemon green. So by analyzing only the colors, it doesn't tell you much, right? So you need something else, all right. So we go into aromas and flavors. So yes, people say that Chenin Blanc have, um, uh, wines made with Chenin Blanc have wet wool character. Every time I, see I say that to my students, they say, what? Wet wool? So uh, it is not very helpful. Then we have green apple, quince, uh, honey. For Riesling, we do have the patro notes, which usually it is a banker for Riesling. Um, and then, you know, Albarino, we talk about nectarine, grapefruit, uh, a salinity to the wine, so kind of a saltiness. And in Gruner, we, we talk about lemon, white pepper, green beans. Most people do not get the green beans or lentils in a Gruner. And all of these wines, they have a fairly high amount of acid. So Chenin Blanc is high acidity, Riesling is high acidity, and then Albarino, it's at least medium plus acidity and Gruner, it's medium plus acidity, okay? So how to differentiate those grapes if they almost, you know, that have the same color and the same levels of acidity? 
So um, this is the traditional way and the way we have been doing for many years, right? Trying to, you know, get the aromas, trying to get the color, but there, that is another way of doing this. And so enters Nick. So Nick, do you wanna tell us a little bit about your, your beyond flavor um, type of structure for these grapes? Uh, sure. So um, I suppose the first thing to say is that I don't discount any of what you've just said. Um, I think all those, uh, you know, the flavors and the color and all that kind of stuff can be very useful, but I think we can go beyond that and um, find some more reliable clues about what the wine might be in a blind tasting. I'm well aware that, you know, this kind of very niche approach is really only um, appropriate for wine students. The normal consumer doesn't really have to worry too much about this, but anyone who's taking exams or anyone who really wants to dig a bit deeper into what makes these varieties uh, distinguishable from one another, what makes them have the taste that they do have. I think it's kind of interesting to think about these levels. Um, so what I really think about when we are talking about white wines is, the, uh, is what I call the acid structure. What is acid structure? Acid structure is, plays the same role in a white wine as tannin structure plays in a red wine. It's what gives the wine a shape, an architecture, um, a sense of uh, organization in the mouth. It's not just a big flabby mess. It's, um, and you might think, well, this is all a bit um, esoteric, but I think that if you, we often complain actually about wines that lack acid structure. Um, if we have a very ripe or overripe Chardonnay from California or Australia, or whatever we say, oh, you know, where's the acidity? Where's because the acidity isn't just freshness, but it's also giving a sense of uh, shape and of purpose to the wine when it's on your palate. Um, and for whatever reason, I think that gives um, pleasure when you're drinking it. So acid structure, what is acid structure? It's a sense of architecture. Now I divide um, my appreciation of acid structure into three uh, parts. The first part of acid structure is simply the level of acidity, which you really touched on uh, in the previous slide. Um, some varieties have naturally high levels of acidity, for instance, uh, Chenin Blanc. Um, some have got more medium uh, levels of acidity. Of course, this always depends on climate, but take, for instance, Chardonnay. In many places around the world, Chardonnay only has moderate levels of acidity. Um, and then occasionally, although far more uh, rarely than people think, some wines have got very uh, low acidity. Um, you know, someone might say something like Gewurztraminer in that, in that category, although I think that actually even those varieties, those kind of varieties have got more acidity than you think. So I don't really think there's any varieties which have got low acidity. Um, so that's one part, simply the level of acidity. Um, the second part is um, about the, the type of acidity. So for instance, you can see in the Chenin Blanc, the first thing is bracing. I'm saying that's um, my, it's not really my terminology, but it is the term which speaks to me, which means that when you're tasting a Chenin Blanc, the acidity has got a quality where it causes you to brace. It kind of knocks you back. You're like, whoa, where did that come from? That's bracing. And um, each, each different white wine to me has got one or two or three terms which really sum up the quality, the, the type of that acidity, what it feels like. And then the final thing, and I think this is the part where people think I'm, I get a bit crazy, is uh, the shape of the acidity in each wine. Um, and so um, what I've noticed is that you can feel acidity at different places and at different levels during the time the wine spends on your palate. So the first important part of that statement is that the wine has to spend time on your palate for you to be able to appreciate it. I think that's probably obvious to everyone who's on this uh, webinar, but um, what I mean is don't just swallow it. Let it sit there three, four, five seconds and swirl it around and get everything out of that acid structure that you can. And then think about, am I feeling the acidity most strongly at the beginning or in the middle or at the end, or is it completely consistent all the way through? Um, and what I've noticed is that whatever different climate these kind of uh, varieties are grown in, um, you do find a very consistent acid structure, which means that the shape of that acidity, where on 
the, what I call the journey of the wine across the palate. Um, where or when during that journey do you feel the acidity most strongly? Um, and so some wines, you feel it most strongly at the beginning, some at the end, um, some it kind of goes up and down. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight. Um, the pH of wines with higher acidity are in fact lower or the pH does not correlate at all. So um, we, let's not get too much into the weeds about the difference between pH and acidity. pH is um, a, it's not quite a measure of acidity. Acidity is the sense of freshness. pH is a sense of, in wine, I think, how hard the wine is or how soft it is in a white wine. So, for instance, a wine with a high pH, again, might be something like a Gewürztraminer with all that rich, soft body, uh, kind of Rubens-esque. Whereas uh, a wine with a low pH might be um, a Champagne, it has very low pH, or uh, even the first wine we're tasting tonight has got quite a low pH. Um, so they are almost always correlated. The higher acidity has got lower pH, which means it feels drier and harder, usually. Um, Alessandra, do you want me to talk about each each one of these four varieties you have on the screen? Yes. Okay. Let me go ahead and put all four in here so, so we can compare them. So I'm not going to go through every word here. Um, you can read for yourself, but this is mostly my terminology. Um, so for instance, the Chenin Blanc, the crescendo shaped acid structure. I think this is, um, this is quite an easy one to understand and I quite like it because I find it to be very consistently true, which is that a crescendo, as you know, in music is when the music starts out being quiet and gra gradually gets louder. And anyone who's a musician will know the symbol for that in music is like the jaws of like a hairpin opening up like that. It's a crescendo. And so Chenin Blanc tastes quite soft to start with. And you think, oh, there's not that much acid in this wine. But then the acidity gets stronger and stronger during the time you have the, mouth, the wine on your, in your mouth. Um, and so it really is piercing at the finish, so much so that you have to either spit or swallow because it's so strong, it's so shrill, you can't bear to have it sitting there on your palate any longer. So that's the crescendo of Chenin Blanc. Riesling um, is what I call a vertical acid structure. Now, this is not an easy concept to grasp, but um, it might be better um, in comparison to Chardonnay Chardonnay is a wine which has got a very horizontal acid structure, which means that the wine, um, the acidity level throughout a Chardonnay is very consistent. It's not up or down, it's just level all the way through. And more than that, Chardonnay has a sense of direction. It's always going somewhere. The wine never feels stagnant on your palate. It's not heavy, it's always on a journey somewhere. And so you feel like it's got a real sense of purpose, that Chardonnay. And that's why it's horizontal, because it's like an arrow, it's pointing, I'm going this way, that's horizontal. Now vertical, by contrast, is really, in a way, the opposite to that, because vertical means the wine is almost pinned down in place, like a stake uh, in the ground. It's pinning the, the rest of the wine in place. So what I always think about in uh, Riesling is like the acidity is like the backbone of the wine, and the other elements of the wine the fruit and the sugar and the body, they all go round the edge of the acid, which is the backbone. So um, that's why it's a vertical structure because it pins the wine in place so much so the wine doesn't really feel whether it, that it's going anywhere. Um, the fireman's pole is just my own silly uh, terminology because I think the, the quality, we talk about the type or the quality of the acidity, uh, in Riesling, the, uh, the type or the quality of the acidity is almost always steely like steel, it means that uh, it kind of reflects the light. Um, and so I always think about a vertical fireman's pole <laughs> because the pole is like the backbone of the wine and it's made out of steel. It kind of reflects the light. Um, and so that's Riesling. Albarino is, um, is one of the ones which I think people do have a harder time using my terminology. So maybe I'm not as accurate uh, on Albarino. But what I would say is that um, you get very strongly in Albarino a sense of a big wall of acidity in Albarino hitting the front of your palate as soon as you put the wine in your mouth. And then the acidity kind of, kind of disappears for a moment. And then a few seconds later, it comes, the wall re-emerges at the end and really slaps your palate again, uh, right at the end of the time the wine is on your palate, right before you swallow. Now, 
I've used this idea of a square as a structure. Um, so there's walls at either end. And then I have this idea that um, the sensation of the acidity where you feel the acidity most strongly between the two walls is on the floor and on the ceiling of your palate, literally. I mean, I mean, physically on the floor of your palate and on the, on the roof of your mouth. So uh, you get the wall, you get the floor and the ceiling, and then you get the last wall. So it's like a, a building, it's like a square. However, what I would say uh, is that some people don't get so much the floor and the ceiling, they just get the two walls. So don't sweat the square so much, concentrate more on the walls. The final one um, here has got another very characteristic um, acid structure, which I, I've, I've named the roller, the roller coaster acid structure, which means that it sounds kind of crazy, but just bear with me here. The wine goes, the perception of the acidity at the beginning, it's not that high. You think, oh, this wine has only got moderate acidity, but then it very quickly goes up and you're like, oh, it actually has got some acidity. But just when you're thinking that, then it drops off again and goes all the way back down. And you're like, oh, well, where's the acidity gone? But then it climbs up again, even stronger than it was to start with. So it's up a little bit, down a lot, and then up even more than it was to start with. So it's like a roller coaster. Um, and the reason why Al Grunio and Grunewald Lina are next to each other here and next to each other in my book is because those are two varieties that blind tasters have a lot of difficulty with uh, distinguishing between. But if you think about it in terms of um, acid structure, they're actually very, very different. So um, if you can taste for acidity, then you really shouldn't have that um, confusion. But that's probably enough theory. We should probably do some tasting, huh? I think this is fascinating. And um, so when I met Nick early January, um, and you know, I have read the book, and then we met at the seminar in, in, in Washington, in Woodinville, and then I, I discover about this type of tasting, which some people call it architecturally, uh, architecturally tasting or something like that. But I thought it was really interesting to, to you know, try to find these shapes um, in your palate. So, yeah, it's very cool. Um, all right, so first wine, yes. So go ahead and pour the first wine. So, um, Last time you guys were here, um, some people said that we were mean because we had one variety only. Um, so, so this time we do have three different varietals, okay? So go ahead and pour wine number one. Uh, please do not look at the shape of the bottle or anything. Um, again, I mentioned wine number one is under screw cap, so um, don't look at it and just pour it in your glass and start tasting. Oh, okay, Patra is already, already drinking, good for you. Okay, all right, so um, we do have the polls like we, we had last time, and maybe I'll go back in here so people can taste and see what type of um, acid structure you, you feel, so. So it is one of these four varieties, so you just have to match the description. So actually, I would say that looking at these four varieties, um, three of them are wines which feature different levels or, or you perceive different levels of acidity during the time the wine is on your palate. The Chenin Blanc, the Albarino and the Gruna, they seem to be felt more or less strongly at different times. Whereas Riesling is probably the only one which is constant. It's just, it's just all, it just stays at the same level. You perceive it at the same level throughout the time. So Nick, you have the wine, same wine as we do. Uh, do you think this wine is showing this vertical acid, uh, this structure? Um, yes, 
I think this is um, I think this is a very fair a fair example. Yeah. Okay. All right. Ready, guys. Um, so we can put our first poll out in here. Um, yes. So imagine the shape, Nicole. Okay. Uh, Nick, I think you control the, um, the poll. Okay. okay, bring it back to the slide so everyone can see the descriptions again. Now, of course, you can't, and neither can I, and neither should you try and turn off your brain to those other parts of the wine that we were talking about at the beginning, you know, the flavors, the, the aromas, the color, all that kind of stuff. That's all very, very relevant. Um, but I do think this wine, you could have a more, um, if it came from a different region of origin, you could have a more pure example of it. So this is a little bit challenging, actually, I think, the, the first one in some ways. Um, but use all the, the, the the, the tools that you have in your toolbox to try and figure out what it is. Okay, we've got uh, almost 50% of people have voted. So let's give this another 30 seconds to submit your answers. I, I, I do think that it, I, I don't don't sweat it if it, you find it hard to concentrate on on acid structure when you've been thinking about flavor for so long. It, it kind of is a it's almost like a mental test to see whether you can overcome that uh, that bias. You know, we've all been taught that way. It's very hard to just overcome it just just like that. Um, but I think what you can do is even if you get hung up on the flavors and the aromas, then nonetheless to look for the confirmation in the acid structure, right? Um, that can be something which can really give you a strong sense that you're in the right place. Okay, so um, we have 70% of people voting. Um, so I'm going to give it 10, 10 more seconds. If anyone who hasn't voted wants to vote, vote right now. And then I'm going to close it down. Okay, we've got some final votes coming in. It, it definitely requires practice. This isn't something where people just understand it intuitively, um, because I think apart from anything else, they have to get used to the language that I'm using. It's as much a language challenge as, as it is a, a palate, a tasting challenge. Um, and you have to work with it for a long time. And the other thing you've got to do is you have to do these tastings open. You have to have all these four wines open next to each other and then taste, look at the language and then think, oh yes, I get it. And only when you get each wine, you understand what my language means can you then uh, look for those things in a blind tasting? In a way, we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves, but I think, I think it's fun. I think it's Friday night fun. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, stop the poll. Okay, here are the results. Um, so uh, Riesling and Gruner a little bit uh, further out there than, than the others. Um, and uh, Indeed, uh, one of those two leading varieties is correct. Um, Alessandra, do you want to do country or, or do you want to reveal what the variety is? Let's do country. Okay, so let's just remember that Riesling and Gruner were a bit ahead of the others. Okay. Poll two. Now, um, you have to, in a way, be a bit logical here. Of course, you can change your answer, but if you think that a great variety is very strongly associated with the country, with a certain country, then you do well to go for that country. Um, there's no point in saying like, oh, Alborino from Germany or something. Yeah, and I haven't, uh, I have decided not to put the subregions in here, otherwise it would be too much of a clue. So it is just the countries, I didn't put any subregion in here. Um, and, and going back to what Sarah asked, um, I agree that, you know, you need to practice and train a little bit. But for instance, the Cabernet versus Merlot for me was a big, um, 
um, a big help because, you know, some Merlots, especially coming from California and Cabernets, they are all ripe, they are all fruity, they all have high tannins and moderate acidity. So what do you do? And, and I think the tannin structure was uh, what helped me in, in blind tasting. So. Okay, so um, let's just give it another another 30 seconds. Uh, if you haven't voted already and put your vote in. It's actually, I don't find this wine to be a particularly aromatic wine. It's not like a Sauvignon Blanc or a Viognier or something like that. And in a way, it's good to, to kind of test this theory with those kind of wines because it gives you less to go on. Uh, you really have to rely a bit more on the acid structure. That's the kind of fun part. Yeah. And sometimes I remember when I was preparing for the MW exam, I used to serve these kind of wines like as cold as I could right out of the fridge. So I wouldn't be able to taste anything even if I wanted to apart from structure. And, and Nick really smelling this wine tonight. Um, it is, it isn't very aromatic, right? No, um, um, I have had this wine be more aromatic than it is, but I wouldn't say that it's an abundantly aromatic wine at the best of times. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a problem with that. I quite enjoy this wine, I must admit. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, final five seconds, last votes, put your votes in now. Okay, thank you for voting. I'm gonna end this poll. Okay, I'm gonna show you these results. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, so Germany, Australia. Um, so the two leading varieties were Riesling and Grunewald Lina. So I guess, you know, there's a strong bias towards Germany and Australia, but my question is how much Grunewald Lina is there in Germany and Australia? Um, not very much. So um, I think people have got the, they're on the right track here. This is Riesling, um, I think it's pretty delicious. Um, obviously this is a dry Riesling and there's many, many dry Rieslings from Germany. In fact, most uh, German Rieslings are dry, um, but this one is from Australia. Uh, so good work with anyone who said that. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go to the wine in a second. So um, in Nick's book, actually he goes over countries and regions and saying what you should expect from countries and regions. And um, this is an Australian Ries uh, Riesling from Eden Valley. And it says a lot about um, the limey notes, uh, which I agree for this wine. It's, it's just like lime juice um, in here. So yes, POC Vale dry Riesling, 100% Riesling, Eden Valley, Australia. Uh, that's the other side of Barossa Valley. Uh, it is dry, stainless steel tanks, so no oak, no malolactic, no lease for this wine, and uh, vegan wine, they say. Uh, they actually work organically and biodynamically for a lot of the, their vineyards. It, POC Vale was established in 1847, um, the state. And uh, yes, seventeen ninety nine. So I think it is a great price for the wine. Yeah, I visited this uh, vineyard uh, back in um, twenty fifteen. Uh, it's uh, Eden Valley is one of the most misnamed places in wine. It's not a valley at all. It's a plateau. It's a plateau above the Barossa Valley. You have to climb up out of the Barossa Valley to get to Eden. Eden is uh, very windswept. It's very cool. We were there at the beginning of the growing season in late October. And we were wearing, you know, jackets and coats and everything. It was not warm. And um, it was, you know, it's, it was a German settlement originally. Uh, it's not an accident that there's reasoning in this part. Um, and it was the perfect conditions when we were there for making uh, crisp, brisk, uh, dry reasoning like this. Um, but I think maybe we can go back to that slide showing what the different uh, structures are for each variety. And let's just see whether we can make any sense of this. And if you guys don't get what I'm saying here about reasoning, then that's totally fine. <laughs> it's, uh, this is quite abstract language and it requires a kind of visualization of um, sensory sensations, which are, are, are quite, it's quite hard to do. So, if you don't, so don't worry about it. But what I do think, I do think you get the, um, the vertical acid structure here. 
in the sense that the wine isn't trying to go anywhere. It's not trying to move. It's just, it just sits there. And the other thing I think is quite important about Riesling is the sense that the acid uh, stays at the same level throughout. It doesn't go up or down. It's just firm. Uh, it's quite it's strong. It's always high, of course. That steely acidity, very, very consistent throughout Riesling. So guys, now that you tasted the wine, you know what it is, um, what do you guys think? Can you see the acid structure? Can you see the farming's bowl in here? The steely acidity? I, I, I do see that the... Um, I do find this one to be quite steely on the on the finish. I mean, these terms are very amorphous, so don't get hung up on them. What I'm calling steely, you might consider that kind of saltiness as well that you get on the finish of this wine. I do think there's something of that. Um, you know, John Baptiste Lacayon, the winemaker of Roderer, one of the most brilliant winemakers out there, he always talks about this concept of sapidity, which is it's a very com complex idea, which isn't really defined anywhere but it's a combination of acid ph saltiness um, some phenolic elements which are like the hard matter um, which still remains in white wines um, and that all can add to a sense of freshness um, but i do think this one quite quite steely it's like i don't know i don't know like have you ever bitten into a uh, into your fork for instance when it hasn't got any food on it and you almost taste the, the steeliness it's a bit like that um, do you find that the D or the acidification changes the structure as well as the level of acid? Well, um, I think acidification is a very hard thing for anyone to want to go on the record about and say, oh, 100% this wine is acidified. Um, Deacidification is, you know, pretty rare, I think, in this, in this day and age. Um, but acidification happens a lot in Australia. I'd be very surprised if this wine is acidified. Um, it feels very integrated. It's really a question of yield management and harvest date um which is going to control the acidity um and remember riesling as well is a variety that naturally retains its acidity quite well uh, you can leave it as they do in germany on the vine for a long time until october november and january for ice wine and the acidity doesn't really go anywhere so happy days um uh, uh, acidification in warm climates um, gives wines which are very hard on the finish um, the, you think, oh, I, I understand this wine, and then you get this big slab of hard, low pH stuff on the back, and then you're like, where did that come from? And that slight disjointed nature, that hardness, is often a sign of acidification. But again, don't get hung up on acidification. Very hard to taste, very difficult to, to recognize. Um, so does it change the structure? Um, I think, I suppose it does in the sense that I do think you feel it right on the finish. Um, in that sense, yes. But before that, you might get the native structure of the variety. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other questions in the chat box um, about reasoning before we, um, before we move on? Um, I just want to make a comment that, you know, blind tasting this wine, I, do, I did feel the saltiness as well. And the petrol notes were not, you know, in your face. Um, and normally this wine has a lot of petrol notes. Of course, this is 2018 vintage, so it is brand new, but it is one of the wines in the blind tasting that maybe you don't call it a Riesling because you don't feel the petrol notes. So yes, the, the acid structure will be helpful in this case. Yeah. All right, so um, should we move on to tasting the second wine? Definitely. All right, guys, so um, I'm gonna leave this table in here. So go ahead and pour wine number two. I just wanna have to run downstairs to the kitchen and grab it. Sure. All right, so pour wine number two and um, go ahead and start tasting it. 
So any of you really thought this was a Riesling? Uh, and Celeste um, and Nicole, we tasted this Pusey Vale millions of times, millions of times. Do you, did you think it was this wine? And I think Celeste, you tasted last week, right? With the WCT level two uh, group. Okay, recognize the cap. You shouldn't be looking at the cap. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I always, um, you know, tell people the day I went to taste with a master of wine here in Miami, and he poured the wines blind to me. It was all white wines. I was super nervous. The wines were cold. I called them all Chardonnay, and they were all Riesling. Okay, and that was last year. So it wasn't too long ago, like 10 years ago that happened to me. No, no, it was last year. So I was so nervous and the wines were so cold that I totally did not see the petrol notes in the wine. So, so yes, you know, that would have helped me. And yes, Mary and Antonio, you're, you're laughing. And this was the guy who later would, um, you know, so you know the guy, it is Eric Hemer because you, you met him um, during Vino Summit. So this was with Eric Hemer, and he would late um, recommend me to the Master of Wine program. So can you imagine me tasting with him? And then, you know, yes. Um, I guess I just have a question for everyone. Uh, you might've just spoken about this, uh, but the, um, if anyone wants to know what reduction in wine is, this is a very reduced wine. That smokiness, the in that intense smokiness you get on the nose, it's pure reduction. Are you talking about wine number two? Yep. Um, funnily enough, um, we know that the um, the previous wine was under screw cap, and you often get reduction under screw cap, but less so under cork. This one was under cork, but this one is much more reduced than the previous one. So 101, reduction. Reduction is the absence of oxygen during winemaking process and at bottling, which means that the um, aromas and flavors often don't burst out. They're not um, so aromatic as you'd expect them to be. And they're in instead replaced with this kind of struck match or block drains or rotting eggs kind of aroma. And here in this particular wine, it takes the form of a kind of smokiness, a flinty smokiness. Um, and what we call in wine terms, esters, these um, very fruity aromas, but which are somehow a bit quelled. Here, it's a bit like a pear drop or banana on the nose. And you're like, Hmm, this is a bit strange, but actually on the palate, it's much more uh, expressive, but that's very typical of reduction. Reduction is almost always just on the nose. It's a lot of wine making in this wine. Sure. Kind of interesting though it's an interesting wine it's a kind of intellectual wine a little bit you have to to sit with it and think about it and think you you even have to think oh do i like it or not but it's just it's interesting the other wine the previous wine which i mean i like all wine geeks i love reasoning you know it's but to me that was it was, it was pleasure but it was quite uncomplicated pleasure whereas this is a bit more um a bit more cerebral yeah i like it too but for, you know, I think it is it's worth going back to Riesling to compare and contrast the acid structure. Um, so you can really try to imagine um, the shapes in here. I mean, we actually have used, we, we, since we had Riesling first, we've used up the only one with the constant acidity. You're now looking for wines which have got differing levels of acidity during the time the wine spends on your mouth, ups and downs. So your challenge is to really think about when and where during that time on your mouth, you feel it most intently. I 
I'm not tasting the wine blind. I know what it is. So, you know, the advantage of writing books about blind wine tasting is that you never have to taste blind again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, the saltiness on the nose is, is what is the reduction that I'm talking about. Um, it, is, it, is, it is salty as well, but it's that sort of slightly flinty quality as well. You know, that's, um, that's actually also reduction. There's, um, that steely flinty thing is actually not native to the wine. But anyway, so I think it's probably time for the poll. Uh, is everyone ready to make their call? Let's do this. So let's do um, grape variety first. There's three. There's three choices because we've already had Riesling and we've we've told you there's going to be there's going to be three different uh, grape varieties tonight. But you've got four options here. But if anyone votes for Riesling, then I know you've already drunk too much. And very interestingly for this wine, if you try to go for aromas, it, it doesn't really have, you know, it doesn't take any boxes for uh, any of these varieties or something that is clearly the banker or clearly tells you what it is. So you have to dig deeper. Yeah, I agree with that, and that's a great point because, uh, in that respect, it's similar to the um, to the first wine. Um, the aromas really do not give the game away here at all. Um, it's a good candidate for structural tasting. Um, and remind me, I am just talk about wine making this wine when we're uh, when we're done, um, because it's interesting to taste the wine making. I'm just looking up the text sheet to make sure I'm tasting what actually happened. All right, guys, go and vote. So yes, we have Chenin Blanc, Albarino, and Gruner Valkliner as candidates for this wine. So it is getting easier. Now you have only three grapes. So let us know what you think. If it is a crescendo acidity, or if it is a roller coaster acidity, or a square acid structure. Okay, so I'm going to give everyone another uh, 20 seconds. So if you would like to vote, um, but have not yet voted, I still think that the proportion of people voting here is, is better than in a general election. Um, so maybe we should, you know, incentivize people with wine. Um, we got 78% who voted already, so that's great. Um, okay, so I think that might be our lot. Oh, two more latecomers. Okay, would the last two people out there who haven't voted like to vote? If so, do so now. Um, otherwise, we will uh, move without revealing what the variety is. We will move right on to the region question. Okay, so let's do that. Oh well, I'll show you the results, but we won't we won't reveal what the answer is. So here are the results. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So I'll bring you obviously with the lead over Chenin Blanc. Okay. So then now. Let's do the country or region question. And while we wait, I noticed Claudia Zarate is here. So she's based in Texas. Um, are you tasting anything tonight, Claudia? Any whites? Or do you have any blind wines for you to taste? Okay, well, everyone's voting quickly. So uh, we had, uh, uh, we're almost up to the same number of people who voted in the first round. If the one person who voted in the first round who hasn't voted yet would like to vote, please do, please do so now. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to end the poll uh, now. Okay, here are the answers to that one. Um, so Spain with a clear lead here. Um, yes, uh, would you like to reveal the results, Alessandra? Yeah, sure. So, okay, good job, guys. Um, some of you are right, <laughs> or most of you are right. Um, this is actually, um, yes, La Caña Albariño 2018, 100% Albariño, we as Baixas in Spain, uh, 1899, and Nick is going to talk about winemaking for this wine. Well, I, I, I think the really interesting thing about the wine is um, I feel like the winemakers try quite hard to flesh out the wine. Um, we've already spoken about uh, reduction, but it's, uh, let me go back to the fleshing out comment and go back to the reduction to start with. And so he says that, or she says that 70% um, of the wine is fermented in stainless steel and 30% in uh, neutral oak. Um, and then all whatever the vessel used for fermentation is all sits on the leaves for eight months. And then uh, the, the winemaker says at the bottom, excuse me, <clears throat> a slight micro oxygenation through the barrels prevents the risk of reduction that a winemaker runs with stainless steel leaves aging. And <clears throat> the winemaker thinks they've been successful at preventing reduction. I don't think they've been as, as successful at preventing reduction as they think. The very fact that that sentence is in there suggests to me that they know they're sort of on that scale, right? They're sort of preempting the complaints from people like me that the wine is reductive, which isn't, to my mind, a big fault. I don't, they don't need to sweat it. I think it adds an element of interest in a wine like this. Um, so that's interesting. And then, um, so what they're really saying to pass that to explain it a little bit is that um, obviously stainless steel does not admit any oxygen at all. So you can have reduction, you can have those kind of uh, block, block drain aromas if you're not careful. So the purpose of putting 30% of it in oak is that um, oak, even old oak, has got very little, small pores through which oxygen can enter and um, that prevents reduction. So when you blend the two together, you avoid reduction. Uh, the theory is fine. I just think that the stainless steel is speaking a bit more strongly here than the oak is. Um, and then the other thing which is really important about the wine is the Sioli aging. Sioli um, uh, meaning, you know, the yeast. So it's sitting there on the yeast. And the reason why we know that this wine is on the, the yeast compared to most um, Albarinos is that there's a bit more um, texture. There's um, a bit more... Um, a very slight kind of soapiness on, on the mid palate. When I say mid palate, I mean really on the tongue, not at the beginning of the, the palate, not at the end, but sort of in the middle. Um, and that adds a little bit more body, and a little, little bit more textural richness. And that's not always usual uh, with, this, uh, with this variety. So um, I, I think you taste all those things quite, quite clearly. So it's quite an interesting wine to dig into because you can taste the winemaking quite quite clearly. Maybe that wasn't very well explained. Do people have questions about the winemaking? Yeah, and, and please share your opinion. Uh, what do you think about this wine? I think it is a really delicious, but it's not a, a by the book Albarino that I would use for WSET level two class, for instance, because you don't have those flavors of um, apricots or peaches that you expect in a uh, Albarino just like this. So, um, so yeah, this one is a little bit more complex, maybe because of the winemaking and yes, a little bit more interesting and cerebral as Nick says. Yeah, and you know, if someone would taste this wine and say it was Chardonnay on the basis of that rich textured mid palate, that wouldn't be a stupid thing to say. I mean, I would get that completely. Um, that uh, is quite creamy on the mid palate, but that all comes from the lees aging. Um, now, maybe we should talk about acid structure for a sec. Um, uh, Nicole is making the point that um, the, the acid structure of the wine can be quite similar to Gruner Beltlina because both of them um, have quite a lot of acidity at the beginning and then they sort of go down in the middle. They come up again at the end. Um, I agree with that, but I think that um, this is, uh, again, it's a little bit complicated because of the leaves. The leaves are obscuring the structure a little bit on this wine. But I do think that what you have to look out for in Albarino beyond just structure is this kind of hard, 
phenolic green almost bitterness to the acidity the acidity in albarino often doesn't feel quite ripe because it gets wrapped up in the uh in what i call the phenolics um this is quite technical but the phenolics really are those um the solids in the wine which remain there albarino is always one of the most phenolic white uh, white grape varieties. Um, a non-phenolic white grape variety would be Chardonnay. It's, you know, it's quite soft. But anything where there's any hardness, it means that there might be a little bit of skin or seed or something in there, which remain in the wine. And then, so you've got to combine the fact that Albrina has got a very powerful acid structure already. And then you've got those phenolic elements and it adds that real sense of uh, hardness to the wine. And I think that Gruner never has that. Gruner has got this tangy, bright, zesty acidity, which does go up and down a bit like uh, Albrino, but it doesn't have that hardness, which even in spite of the winemaking, which makes it softer here in this particular example, you still get a little bit, especially at the finish. Yeah. If you taste and you pay attention in the acidity only, it's it's quite harsh. I think the one word that I didn't use, which might help to explain the phenolics a little bit, is bitterness. Uh, phenolics always give bitterness in white wines. Many Italian wines are phenolic and slightly bitter. And this one, on the finish, it's almost crunchy. You can almost chew it. And we often think about that in red wines in terms of tannins, but phenolics and white wines are the same thing, really, uh, just the white equivalent. And here, that crunchy phenolic thing is very Albrino. It's got one of the most strong structures because you've got the phenolics and the high acidity that combine to create one of the most structured white wines out there. Yeah. I sort of wonder, in a way, whether the Lee's aging in a wine like this and I know some people uh, in Riesch Beisches also experiment with oak or even new oak, is an attempt to balance that slightly aggressive green phenolic hardness against something else, just to, to soften it out a little bit. But I actually, personally, I actually don't mind that sense of of structure of phenolics of acid because I think that's what makes the variety so so characterful and uh, so good with food as well. I agree. Yeah, this is delicious. I, I love this wine. Um, we normally use Burgunds for classes, which is really, you know, no lees, no oak, um, very fruit forward. Um, so yes, but this is a much complex wine similar price point and and yeah it's delicious any other questions or comments about this wine before we move on and you know always feel free to go back to the riesling first because i i i think it helps when you go back retaste and try to feel the differences in acidity yeah i agree on uh, the different shapes yeah Okay, good for you, Mary, that you got it right. All right. Okay, so wine number three. All right. Okay, I'm just gonna run downstairs again, excuse me. All right. Okay, so poor wine number three. And Let's see if this is similar or different. And let me put in here as well. This one is very reductive on the nose. Uh, the burn match is definitely here. Right? So, yeah. 
So basically tonight for these three wines, we couldn't get anything from the aromas. Um, so we really have to taste for structure because the aromatics are not helping at all tonight. So let me check something in here. There is an app which um, it's called When Wine. And um, it says it is a leaf day. So, you know, wines are not good for tasting. So, um, Nick, um, very reductive on the nose. Absolutely. And that's the first thing I was going to say. This is the second reductive wine we have tonight. Um, but it depends when you guys open the wine because I opened this wine, I opened all the wines at about 5.30, 5.45, so an hour plus ago. And this wine showed absolutely nothing on opening. And now it's actually pretty glorious on the nose. Okay, that. good. Yeah, I just opened mine. Um, yeah. But it's super reductive on the nose. I agree. Okay. It's just a very characterful wine um, right from the get-go. And, you know, if you guys want to leave this wine for an hour and come back to it, um, you know, even after dinner or even tomorrow, because yeah, honestly, this is this is. I bet this is an indestructible wine as well. I think what I'm not going. On, this is one of my hobby horses. People always say, "Oh, you have to drink wine within 24 hours or 48 hours." I think it's complete BS. I had. If you spend more than 20 bucks on a white wine, many of them are fa fascinating at five days, six days, seven days. You might not want to risk it. I understand. You might not want to <laughs> risk your money like that. But um, I do think it's worth trying every now and then. Just forget about them. And uh, most high acid white wines are just fine. And some reds as well. I, I love next day Barolo. Mm. So it's always better than, you know, the day you open the bottle. The next day, is, the wine is just great. But yeah, this is a super, super interesting wine. Okay, guys, so we had a Riesling. We had an Alvarino. So we have two grapes remaining. And um, either you have to think about a bracing acidity with a crescendo shape or a roller coaster acidity with tangy acidity. Tangy or tangy? How do you say tangy. that? Tangy, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gee. But by the way, I, uh, Sandra, I, I'm, I, I'm not tasting the wine on the tech sheet, a different producer. So I don't know whether that was wine.com or. <laughs> mm. Oh, true. Yes, exactly. The same, right. the same, same appellation, same, same variety. So. Right. Same year too. Yeah. Would it account to help here? 100%. Um, this is, as you can taste it, this is quite a full bodied white wine. And um, I certainly have no hesitation about decanting full bodied whites. I don't, I don't think decanting does much for a Riesling or a Sauvignon Blanc, but um, certainly for Premier Cru Burgundy, White Burgundy, or um, or a wine like this, or if you have uh, a Rhone white, for instance, um, 100%, I love it. I love decanting. I remember when I was, I used to live in, before I moved to the States, I lived in London in about 2010. And at that time there was a, a fad in London for uh, decanting champagne. And um, I sort of, uh, I sort of understood it, but I also sort of didn't in that, in that context, I, I, you know, possibly for vintage champagne, but not for standard non-vintage. I think it's kind of pointless, but um, for, for white wines like this, full-bodied white wines, sure. Okay, so everyone is trying to figure out whether it's um, Chenin Blanc or Gruner. Um, so why don't we launch the poll? Do you think we're, everyone's ready, Alessandra? Yep, okay. Okay. Okay, so Marcos, um, when you decant a wine in Miami, do you keep out at room temperature? If it is a white wine, get your decanter and put it back in your wine cellar or in your fridge. Um, it is not a problem for the reds. I wouldn't say it's a problem to be outside. Well, outside, I mean uh, room temperature with AC, right? Because we are all under AC, not outside, because outside it might be too warm. 
for the wines. Okay, Nicole is feeling confident on this one. Um, I think the, the shape in this one is definitely showing. Um, not the aromatics, but you know, definitely you feel the shape of the wine. That's a very nice wine. Well, the one I'm drinking is. I don't know what you guys are drinking, but I had this on wine.com. I love wine.com. I, you know, I think they've got the customer service down and the shipping and all that and the discounts and it's all, it's all, it's all good. If, I mean, they can't do the kind of specialist wines that you do, Alessandra, because they're a big enterprise, but um, they sometimes do it where they switch out a very similar wine. They don't tell you. I don't know whether they even realize whether they're just pulling the wrong item. But they get it close. They get the same appellation, the same price, but a different producer. And you're like, well, that's quite different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, last votes. We just need a couple more people. Um, we're going to give you another 10 seconds. All right, guys, go and vote. Um... Okay. Well, uh, 16 out of 19, that's good. So I will uh, end this poll now. And I will show you these results. Now that's pretty definitive. Um, and I think Alessandri, you probably agree that uh, at this point it's a bit pointless doing a country poll. Uh, we know where the Chenin Blanc is grown uh, in Europe at least. Um, and we know where Grunewald Lina is really an Austrian variety. It is grown in a couple of new world countries, just a sort of experiment, but really it's a bit of a minority. Uh, thing Chenin Blanc, uh, of course, is maybe the great white grape of South Africa, and that makes very uh, lovely. And uh, I was going to say charming, but that would be patronising. They're more than charming; they're very serious wines from South Africa, uh, and they're very they're very nice. But of course, the main place for Chenin Blanc is the Loire Valley. So um, yeah, let's let's not bother doing that. But uh, Alessandra, go ahead with what the wine is. Okay, so great job, guys. This is um, Vouvray. So this is Claude de Vigneault of Vouvray 2016 from uh, the producer Alexandre Montmousseau. 100% uh, Chenin Blanc uh, from the Loire Valley in France. Okay, let me correct. Sorry. Let me correct a few things in here. Um, so yes, 81% of the people. Good job. Yeah, and that's fine. At least the one we are tasting is a little bit of dry. So it has a little bit of sugar, but it, it is very balanced. You almost um, don't notice. So I don't know if any of you notice the, the sugar, the slightly residual sugar in this wine. They don't say um, how much there is uh, in the technical sheet, but yes, um, they say that, you know, um, so this producer actually, he's part of this school of thought and, and he has received his schooling in bone and he, he likes his wine to be sec, tendre, so soft, dry. So mm. yes, it is more to the dry side, but there is, you know, a little bit of residual sugar in here. Maybe five grams or something, maybe like, you know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. All right. So Nicole did a great job. Redemption and Mary did notice the sugar. Okay. So can you see the crescendo acidity? Yes. And this is the wine. Yeah. I mean, I think the really um, one of the aspects about uh, Loire Valley Chenin Blanc um, is that. Um, is that the sweetness and often there is sweetness in Vouvray, especially. Uh, in other appellations, in Saumur, for instance, if you have the great Breze, Vineyard, um, Guy Berteau, people like people like that, or um, elsewhere in the Loire, even in Mont-Louis, which, as you know, is just across the river from Fouvray, not always, 
but usually both of those regions are drier than Vouvray. And I think that's not because, you know, producers just love sugar in Vouvray. I think it's because Vouvray has got such screaming acidity that you have to balance it out a little bit. So what is really interesting about tasting for structure in a wine like this is that the crescendo of Chenin Blanc is, is in fact exaggerated by the fact of the presence of residual sugar because residual sugar gives the softness on the tongue right at the beginning. You know, we all know that's where you perceive sugar right on the tongue. So as soon as you, as soon as it hits the palate, that's the first thing you taste. And that taste is a soft, giving, generous taste. And so there's not much acidity to begin with at the beginning of the journey on the palate of Chenin Blanc. And then that gets compounded by the presence of sugar. So it's soft on soft. And then the acidity grows and the wine almost seems to dry out. I felt more bracing than crescendo. Well, I mean, either or both are good. I, I do think it's bracing. I think maybe try holding the wine in your palate for more than five seconds and see whether you can even keep it there because the acidity in, in, in the Vouvray is so strong that um, you have to spit or swallow. It just becomes too much. And that's what I'm calling bracing. Um, Nick, quick question. So normally when I, I taste for acidity, what I'll do is I'll put the wine in my mouth. I, um, I then spit and I open my mouth so I can breathe in and kind of feel the acidity. Do you feel that, you know, should do with your mouth closed or any? Yes. Um, I, I love that test. I think in this wine, the acidity is so strong, <laughs> um, on the finish that um, you don't need to even need to do that test on this particular wine. But, uh, you know, a good wine where you could do that test is with the, the, the first wine, the Riesling, where it's quite a, um, it's quite a supple, gay mine, kind of easy wine. But then you actually stop and think about the acidity in that way. You put it to the test and you realize, wow, that acidity is really high. So in fact, all the wines today, and it, we didn't have a Grunewald Lina today, but that too, all four of these wines, to my mind, have got high acidity. They really do, all of them. Um, and I think that's what makes them such wonderful varieties. They're so good with food and they're able to support their body so well. Um, but um, I do think that if you're ever in any doubt, it's a great thing to do, to open your mouth, look like an idiot, <laughs> just take in the air and feel how much your mouth waters. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mary Kate um, says she has three South Africans there and they didn't identify this as a Shannon. So they are in Fort Lauderdale. They are inside the yacht. Are you girls in quarantine still? So yes, they prefer South African Shannon though because of the fruity flavors. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Is it because you find it uh, South African Shannon to be more, more purely fruity um, or is it because it's more generous in body? and a bit softer, especially at the beginning. I, I actually love to do this exercise, the structure exercise with South African Chenin Blanc, because um, often it tastes like uh, Chardonnay to begin with, um, kind of oaky, full-bodied, soft Chardonnay. And you're like, oh, I, I know what this wine is. It's tropical, new world, guava-scented Chardonnay. But in fact, then the acidity just creeps up and creeps up and creeps up on you. So you keep on wanting to say it's Chardonnay. You're like, no, it, it, it can't be. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's where the, I think the acid structure approach is really, is really useful. I think, you know, Vouvray is one of those wines that I believe, you know, where I grew up in the UK in the 1980s was very popular. I think Vouvray is quite frankly, not a, a sexy appellation right now. I think uh, the combination of a high acid, medium to full body and, you know, 15 to 20 grams of residual sugar is, is not the recipe the world wants um, right now. It's, it's, it's a bit of a tough sell, but um, the wines can offer really remarkable complexity and longevity for a sub $30 price. I, I, think, I think they're great. And if you forget them in the cellar for 10 or 20 years, even better. Yeah, yeah, true. Um... So Mary's saying she's getting a Chenin Blanc from California soon, so we'll try um, to compare. 
course, um, and, and, you know, from South Africa as well. We do taste South Africa Chenin Blanc for um, the, the, the publicity classes, but like Nick is saying, they have oak, they have malolactic, a little bit of malolactic, some of them. Um, some of them have uh, surdy aging as well. So you have more texture, more body, and then a lot of fruit. So it is a little bit different. Um, so guys, did you like this wine? So any thoughts, any comments, questions? But the acidity is truly bracing, Nick. You, you're right. It's something that, you know, the acidity for the Riesling was high, but this one is, ah, yeah. On the finish, I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, it's almost, it's almost painful. Um, but that's what's so cool about the wine. That if you had that, if you had that acidity all the way through, then that wine might almost be off-putting. But it's like actually it works really, really well because the 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 sweet softness from the sugar goes down just as the acidity comes up, and that's the the balancing. It's like, it's like a seesaw, you know. It's balanced. Yeah, true. Okay, Vera was the winner for Mary. Um, Nicole Ramos loved the Vera as well. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah. Vouvray, the winner for Aiden, reasoning for, for Sarah. Good. Okay. It's great that you're tasting with a lot of different people so we can have all different opinions. I, but I agree with Nick. I do think that um, the La Caña Albarino, um, you know, it is a wine that you should drink a little bit later tonight. The Vouvray you can drink tomorrow, so you can have all well, wines during the weekend. Um, yeah, because they will change and, and will be probably a lot more fruitier than, than what they are now. Yeah. I, I think these are, I mean, there's a reason why, um, you know, Alessandra chose these varieties, which they're all... Um, very strongly structure varieties. Um, so it's, they're, they're really interesting examples to think about. So if you want to go back you know, tomorrow and think about them again, then, then that's fine. Um, and I think sometimes when the fruit has been a bit more subdued, perhaps after the bowl has been opened a bit, you can see the structure even more strongly. The only one I would comment on is, um, is the Riesling where, you know, we all love, dry raising as people never cease telling us they hate raising because it's sweet so you know but in fact if you have a sweet raising what well, you you do actually see the um, acid structure even more clearly than what we saw tonight because the steely backbone of the acidity is almost highlighted against the softness of the sugar um, and it, it almost unveils the uh, backbone of the acidity uh, more clearly than when it's completely dry. So the very fact that we were able to pick it up tonight in the reasoning was, I think, a very positive thing because it would be much easier, in fact, if it was with a little bit of sugar. Agreed. Yeah, and guys, if you don't have Nick's uh, book, Beyond Flavor, again, you can get on Amazon. And here, for instance, this is the shape of the reasoning acidity. So you see it is a steel pole. Um, and then he has the shape for the Shannon as well. So the crescendo type of shape in here. So you can imagine that on the palette. Um, you don't have one for a Lorio, right? But yes, um, square. I think I have a cube. There might be a cube in there somewhere. Okay. Okay, so Gruner, we didn't taste Gruner. But here is the roller coaster, you know, going up and down. So yeah, it's okay. Yeah, and that is Albarina. Yeah. I, I mean, don't I don't take these illustrations or <laughs> even my descriptions too literally. I mean, I'm just trying to convey in sort of visual terms what it feels like. But of course, it's very personal uh, appreciation whether you get that or not. So if you don't, don't sweat it. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, but the truth is, is that blind tasting is very hard. And even though, you know, I have tasted most of these wines millions of times, when you are in a blind tasting and you have no idea what it is, it's quite hard. So if you rely just on aromas, you know, from tonight, we couldn't get anything from the aromas. So uh, the acid structure helps a lot. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, okay. you know, if you have a Sauvignon Blanc or a Viognier or a Gewurztraminer, then... 
yeah, there's there's no harm in thinking about uh, asset structure. And it's always interesting, and of course, those varieties have asset structure just like these ones do. But it's sort it's sort of not the point <laughs> of those varieties. Somehow, I don't really know how to explain it very well. But those varieties, the emphasis is placed a lot more on the aromatics than on the acidity. Whereas here, the acidity is such a determining feature of the whole characteristic of the wine, what its real personality is. Okay. Okay, guys, any other questions um, or comments about this wines? And Nick, can you tell them a little bit about uh, the upcoming webinars that you're organizing? Oh, yes. So um, thank you for the opportunity, Alessandra. I'm, um, I'm doing a series of um, eight webinars starting next Thursday, one a week, every Thursday, um, 5 p.m. Eastern on um, this approach to tasting. So really, it takes the, um, the theories of the book and um, just put, puts them to, to, to the test in a live tasting in a webinar format just like this. Um, so I'll be tasting the wines. Uh, all you guys are encouraged to, to buy the wines to taste along with me. Um, and then we'll, we'll do that in a webinar format. It's going to be three wines just like this, three wines per tasting. Um, and we're going to cover um, as many of the most important varieties as we can um, during eight weeks. So um, it's just an opportunity to um, experience what I'm talking about in the book, but in a slightly more interactive way um, and see whether I can explain or elucidate the, uh, the concepts of the book in a way that is a bit more um, interactive. So, you know, you guys can, can chat and stuff like that. So, um, uh, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to do that, then uh, I think if you haven't already heard about it, the, probably the easiest way to hear about it is by going to my Instagram, which is at Nick Jackson. But there's no O in Jackson. At Nick Jackson. That's all. Yeah, I wrote down so vintagevariation.com, the School of Taste, next Thursday, uh, May 14, 5 p.m. Miami time. Uh, $10 and you can get the wines from us as well if you like. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be there. And what are you tasting next week then? Um, so next week is not completely dissimilar to what uh, we've been doing tonight. Uh, hold on one sec. I'm trying to plan many weeks out. So the first week is actually kind of interesting because um, I don't think many people will get the golden thread unless they've read the book very carefully, but next week it's Chardonnay. Pinot Gris and Semillon. Okay. There is a connection between those varieties, uh, a structural connection. Um, but uh, I, and I hope that the, the, the tasting will illustrate that. The only issue, of course, is that Semillon, especially Hunter Valley Semillon, which is the best example of Semillon, is so freaking hard to find. <laughs> it's, it's tough for people, I know that. So, you know, if you want to participate, you can't find a Semillon. Don't sweat, it's okay. We have that, so, you know. Oh, good for you, good work. Yes, what Florida, a great work. we do have, you know, Hunter Valley semi also. Yeah, and Tyros, actually. So yeah, we do have that brand, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, any other questions, comments for Nick before he goes? Um, thank you so much, Nick, again, for your knowledge, your time, for being uh, with us this Friday. I think this is always very educational, you know, for me as well. And I will retaste this wines blind and, and try to, you know, get the acidity and the shape and keep on practicing. Thank you for having me, Alessandra, and uh, great to be with everyone. Thank you. All right, guys. So happy Friday um, and um, have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay inside, and we'll see you again. All right. Um, Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Okay. You too. Have a great weekend.